Okay, so I'm going to spend about 10, 15 minutes just talking through the, the follow-up for 10 years. Um, and I'd like to start by, by just thanking you, um, the Drift family, really, because that's what you are. Um, all the children and the parents, um, and also the Drift study team, who've worked really, really hard for the last, well, it's many, many years, but the 10-year study has taken us about three years to get the funding and to get the, uh, to get the data in. Um, so you are all part of the Drift family, wow. and um, we, uh, we're very proud that you can be here today. So you've learned, learned a little bit about why the need that was there to, to, um, to do follow-up for 10 years. Andy's put that very eloquently, and so has Steve. Um, mainly because the, the, in the NHS, before we can bring a new treatment in, we need to show that it's effective, but also that it's cost-effective. Because the NHS does not have endless funds. So for something to be brought in as a national therapy, um, it does need to show that it works well enough, but also that there's benefit in terms of the, that it doesn't cost the earth. Now we know drift is a very, very complex form of treatment. Um, currently, and at the time it was done in Bristol, and in the trial there were also children in Poland where it was done, also in Norway and in Scotland, and those are the only places in the world that have ever done drift. It's a very complex treatment, difficult, and risky, it can go wrong. So before we roll this out into the rest of the world, it's very important that we show it's effective, but also that we can train up people to, de deliver, to de deliver this treatment um, safely. So I came from South Africa originally. I trained as a doctor there, and then I came to do my pediatric specialty training here in the UK, because I could see that in the developed world there was a lot to offer in terms of improving quality of life for patients or children with complex needs. I did my training here in Bristol and I worked with Andy Whitelaw. This was in 2000, between 2000 and 2004. And I became inspired by what was being done here. Bristol was at the time, Andy moved from Norway, with all of his expertise around this condition bleeding into the ventricles. And I could see that was what was being done here was very, very special and that there was huge promise in terms of the treatments that would come. So I decided to, to stay in Bristol and work in terms of research to dedicate my career to trying to improve the lives of premature babies. And Andy inspired me, he was my mentor. And when Andy retired, you know, we discussed about what is the future for drift and he said to me, it's really important that we get the 10-year outcomes to know in the long term whether this works or not. So Andy handed the baton over to me at that point, and then it became my baby, so to speak, to convince people mainly to get money to do this. Because, you know, to do a follow-up study like this costs a lot of money, and you need to convince people to give you the funding. So we set off first by thinking, you know, how would we go about this? You can't just go in and do it. You need to first get a proof of principle that, that families would come back to do a 10-year follow-up study. So we approached Steve, Walker Cox and his family, and, and Isaac and, and two other children to see whether they'd be prepared to come back and trial and be a, be a guinea pig, as Isaac said, to see whether people would be prepared to do um, assessments, visual assessments, go into an MRI scanner. And we were very pleasantly surprised to see that all children, all three children were very happy to do it. Um, and that inspired us with confidence that this might succeed. And with this data, we went to the NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research, which is the big funding body in the NHS, and they fund research with taxpayers' money. So they only do research if they think it's worthwhile. And we were very lucky and fortunate that they thought drift is worthwhile getting the 10-year outcomes. It took, it was a long process of about two years of toing and froing, and eventually they agreed that they would fund us 300,000 pounds to do the follow-up study. That's a lot of money. It's the price of a house, isn't it? Um, and of course, there's a huge responsibility then to deliver that if you've been given that money and funding to do it. The first thing we had to do when we got the funding is to put together a, to, to put together a team to do this. Um, because, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a team of, of multiple talents. 
So we needed a, a parent on the steering group, which was Steve, and with all his experience, Steve and, and Becky, his wife. But we also needed psychologists. So we, uh, we were very fortunate in getting Helen Miller in Bristol. You've met Helen. Helen's a very experienced psycholo children's psychologist to do the cognitive assessment, so the assessments around thinking and reasoning. We also found a very good uh, psychologist in Poland, so Gratina Kamita, she did all the assessments in Poland. And we thankfully recruited Sally as our study coordinator, and Sally did a brilliant job to try and trace all of you and bring you all back together. And of course we had to, to find specialists in, eye, in, in assessing the eyes, so that was um, Kathy and Penny. And specialists in MRI, because remember before this, Bristol didn't have an MRI scanner like in Crick. We were very fortunate the University of Bristol and the Trust put together this research centre Crick, which was funded by over three million pounds to build the centre. And it's only because of the centre that we were able actually to do these very advanced MRIs. So we recruited Jade, as you, remember, you may remember Jade, who did all the MRIs, Aileen as well. They are MRI experts together with Adam Smith Collins. And a lot of that analysis of the MRI still needs to happen. It's, it's, it's absolutely massive amounts of data, which will probably take at least a year or two to analyze. So once we had the team together, we then had to start tracing the families. Now, that was a job. You probably know, many of you have moved around, haven't you? How many of you moved, have moved house since, uh, since the drift trial? Yep, there's one hand there. Lots of you, OK. So people had moved around. And this was interesting to find all of you. So um, thanks to the NHS and the NHS number, we could find most of you. You can just go in and find your GP and then go work back from there. Some of you had stayed in contact with Professor Whitelaw, sending Christmas cards and so on, so, um, so that, that was quite easy, that bit. There were also the children in Poland, so there were originally 20 children in the trial in Poland, and we had to find the Polish children, which was hard, because they don't have an NHS in Poland, they don't have an NHS number. Mm -hmm. So we actually lost quite a few uh, children where we couldn't make contact there. But then we had children who'd moved to um, Australia, France, and then there was a child in Norway and a child in France. So we had to, there's the map of the world for the children. So that's Australia. That's our most far-flung participant in the drift trial. Boy who moved to Australia uh, several years ago. And then of course Poland, the UK, which was Scotland, England and Wales. Um, and <coughs> so that, that's Norway, England's there, and, and of course Poland. So we had, it was far flung. And the interesting thing is when, you know, when you do a study like this, of course, at 10 years, it's not just whether the parents are happy to come back, because we know the parents were incredibly, uh, as parents, you were very motivated and loyal to the study in terms of coming back to two, at two years. But at 10 years, it's also about whether you, the children, were prepared to come back. And we were amazed when we, with all the families we made contact with, 98% said they wanted to come back, children and parents. So 98% came back to, to come and be assessed at 10. And that was the biggest surprise of all. I mean, that, that is truly amazing and a tribute and, a th and thanks to you. So you all came back to the Crick Centre. Hopefully you can remember that. I don't know, the kids, do you remember the Crick Centre? You're going to be having your lunch um, in a minute over there and some, some lots of fun and, and get games this afternoon. As I said, Crick was built by the University of Bristol and the, and the UH Bristol Trust um, around four years ago um, with about just over three million pounds um, of research funding. And we were very fortunate to have this venue. We, um, we had uh, the assessment days there, so this is Helen doing um, the, the, the British Ability Scales assessment, which is a, a test of reasoning and thinking skills. Um, and kids, you may remember doing that. Do you remember doing it with Helen? Yeah. And most people found it was quite fun. And we found the children were very good at puzzles. Quite remarkably, isn't it? That was something that stood out. Everybody did, you know, we thought far better than we, we, we would expect. Then, of course, we did the, uh, the movement ABC with Sally. So that's, um, do you know who that is, Sally? I can't see from the there. Ah, Ethan. OK, that's Ethan. And that was the movement assessment, wasn't it? T trying to see how you balance and throw and so on. <coughs> so we did that assessment as well. And that's also part of the movement ABC um, 
And I think that's Joe, isn't it? Yeah, Joe doing, doing the pegboard. Okay, so that was all lots of fun and games. And of course, tracing, tracing between the, the tracks there. All quite difficult things to do. And then there was the MRI. So for all of you, you probably remember, not everyone went in the MRI scanner. Some of you couldn't because you had you know, metal in your bodies. Um, but actually we had, I think 24 children went into the, 27 children went into the MRI scanner and we got beautiful pictures. Um, and some of the uh, scans that we've done are not just pictures, it's also data, massive data sets, which we're still churning on. You know, we've got a very fast computer that analyzes all of this and we will, we will send out, when we have some of the um, results from that, we'll send that out to you as well. But the, the interesting thing is that we wanted to see in general when, when a baby, baby's brain is, um, suffers an insult, how it adapts in the future. And we think we will have lots of data on that to come. So that's Jade there. And I think Jude, Jude that's right, Jude from London, one of our first, and that big expensive MRI scanner. And there's some more of you. Lots of thumbs up, as you can see. The children were very, very enthusiastic about going in there. And of course, you had also watched a video in there, didn't you? Can, and I think the, the most, um, the favourite the favorite video was The Incredibles, um, we, we found in the end. But there was also Cars, Nemo, and, um, uh, and, and lo loads of other films watched. That's the console room, watching into the scanner. And for the kids, you can probably see that foot. You see it? Over here. So that was the assessments where you had to wiggle your toes and then we saw what parts of the brain lit up, which was uh, fascinating. And there's are some of the pictures, so that's an MRI scan, hopefully you, you recognise that. And actually some of our participants, so this is Suleiman from London, who isn't here today, but he became a real expert, as you can see, in, um, in actually analysing the data. <laughs> so that's him there looking at, looking at, the, uh, looking at his brain on the computer. Okay, so moving on to, to, to the results that we have so far. So we've analysed the main trial outcomes. Um, as I said, the MRI uh, analysis will still take some time. And also the analysis around um, the, 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 fi the financial costs of delivering the care and the subsequent NHS costs um, still need to be analysed. We, we had several challenges along the way. One was trying to obviously contact all the families and, and um, that was quite difficult in Poland. So we had some loss to follow up in Poland. The other major challenge was actually going back to hospital notes. So all of you have moved around and you've probably realised the NHS has also changed over the years. Many trusts have actually merged. For instance, North Bristol, haven't they? They've merged into one hospital. And going back to hospital notes to try and work out what's happened to the medical care of the children has been very, very difficult. Some of the notes are not there anymore. So we've had to change tack, and what we're going to do now is to go back to the, uh, the NHS has a database where everything's recorded when, when children access, well, anyone accesses health care. So we're going to go back to that database to try and work out how much health care has been used since birth. Um, and that's something you consented to in, in the 10-year follow-up, but we will be writing a newsletter to you, which will be coming through the mail shortly, to explain how we will be using that data. But that's, those are the only two, two bits of data that we still need to analyse. Now, as you know, as Andy, uh, Professor Whitelaw said, the original trial outcome was around looking at shunts, so whether drift reduced shunts, uh, and whether it improved survival. And we know from the early paper that was published at six months of age, so when the, the children were in their, within their first year, that um, there was no difference between the two treatment arms, the control arm and the drift arm, in terms of shunts. At two years, uh, when Sally did the assessments, which it's very difficult to assess a two-year-old baby in terms of a toddler, in terms of their reasoning skills, but Sally found at two years that there was no difference in motor skills, so movement in the two groups, but potentially there was an advantage in terms of cognitive function or reasoning skills. And at 10 years when we did this, we've obviously done much more advanced testing. So we've done the cognitive tests, the reasoning skills, the movements assessment, the vision, and the MRI. 
And what we found at 10 years is the same thing we found at two. So there is an advantage in terms of the, the cognitive ability. So in drift, uh, the drift group um, had a cognitive advantage in terms of reasoning skills, but there was no other advantage in terms of the movement skills, um, the, the vision, um, and the emotional um, assessment that we did as well, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. What struck us was that the children uh, overall had many talents. So even in the control group overall, uh, the children did extremely well. So there were lots of talents in terms of music, lots of children that actually play music instruments are into music. We have someone like Mark who loves the opera. So in, in, across all abilities in about both groups, um, the children actually had very, very good skills in terms of puzzles, music, um, and reading. So reading was one that came out quite well as well. Um, and that was actually very, very interesting to see. So moving forwards, what about the future? Now, th this is a day where we're paying tribute to all of you. And thanks to, as, and as Professor Whitelaw said, the courage of entering a baby into a trial when a baby is very sick um, and small and premature. Thanks to your loyalty to the trial, so coming back at 10 years, two years and again at 10 years, it's made it possible for us to, to make the conclusion that drift treatment is worthwhile. We know it's an expensive treatment, we know it's a very complex treatment, um, and we do know that going forward, this is going to be the major challenge. We can deliver it here in Bristol, we know that. But to make this a treatment that's accessible for everybody in the NHS, we are going to have to roll this out nationally, which is going to take a major effort. Because it's a complex, difficult treatment, which um, has got risks. If it's not delivered safely, it, it can be damaging. So we are going to have to now take this forward and get funding to take it across the, the NHS, which will probably be something like four centres in the UK. There are only four centres in the UK where potentially this can be delivered, where we have uh, children's neurosurgeons and neonatologists that can uh, potentially be trained up to do this. So that's the plan for the future, to get funding to take this forward and also to convince the National Institute of Clinical Excellence that this is a treatment that they will fund in the NHS. And I'll just end by saying that, um, the, of course, the warriors and the heroes in this entire exercise and making this available for prematures and premature babies in the future is actually our children. So to the babies who were in the drift trial and for all of you that are now at school age, um, you were the pioneers and the warriors who made all of this possible and, um, and we thank you for it.